good evening everyone and uh, welcome to the book discussion forum so as uh, some of you know that uh, during this forum we take one particular chapter and discuss it over the course of this hour so today we'll be dealing with chapter 2 that is titled poverty and we have jito with us who will uh, expose this uh, chapter to us and then based on what he has shared and based on reading we can then also have a kind of a discussion so i now invite jito to begin his presentation good evening everybody we are discussing on the book on sense and sensibility before beginning i would like to bring you a background dr jean dries is a belgian born indian development economist he is the honorary professor in delhi school of economics his major works in india include issues like hunger famine gender inequality child health and education and national rural employment guarantee act this book is a collection of the author's previously published essays written between 2000 and 2017 we'll just go for a synopsis the theme encompasses the whole range of economic development issues namely drought and hunger poverty school meals health care child development and elementary education employment guarantee food security and public distribution system corporate power and technocracy etc in the previous chapter linse addressed the issue and the stories related to drought and hunger he exposed food subsidy scam he elaborated on the aspects of artificially inflated purchase cost selling in the black market low quality of grains etc he had also mentioned the right to food and public accountability under that he covered the bad state of pds food shortage starvation deaths malnutrition etc today i would like you to take you through the second chapter that is on poverty this chapter is divided into six subsections they are first identification of bpl below poverty line the pros and cons second the poverty trap third the bpl club fourth on the poverty line fifth beyond small mercies five hurdles and the sixth squaring the poverty circle now we shall discuss the first subsection the identification of below poverty line pros and cons one of the greatest difficulties with many social programs in india is the selection of eligible households the identification of below poverty line households was problematic the estimates essentially involved a head count of households with monthly per capita expenditure below a pre specified threshold called the poverty line using national sample survey data there is no obvious way of identifying bpl households subject to these caps 
due to the imprecise nature of the proxy indicators compounded by the unreliable survey methods the entire approach had a hit or miss character interestingly bpl targeting gave ways to three alternatives first some entitlements were universalized for instance school meals were extended to all children second some programs were built on the principle of self selection that is allowing people to decide for themselves whether to participate or not national rural employment guarantee scheme is the prime example where every rural household is eligible for a job card but the work requirement ensures that most nrega workers come from deprived sections of the population third in the context of implementing the national food security act some states adopted that what is known as the exclusion approach for example in rural households in jharkhand are now eligible for a ration card under nfsa unless they have a regular government job a four wheel vehicle five acres of irrigated land or 10 acres of any sort of land or a pakka brick house with at least three rooms now we'll go, we will go to the second subsection the poverty trap in the good old days the poverty line was relatively simple concept for example bihar is clearly poorer poorer than punjab one common benchmark was that level of per capita expenditure required to meet pre specified calorie norms in the base year then comes the whole idea of bpl targeting that is of restricting various social benefits in particular the public distribution system to households below the poverty line this quietly transformed the poverty line from a statistical benchmark into a real life social division the division was all the more artificial as the identification of bpl households were highly unreliable the real life poverty line not only divides people it divides them in cruel and destructive manner the recent tendulkar committee report in 2009 further complicated matters by claiming for the first time that the poverty line ensures adequacy of actual poverty private expenditure on food education and health the tendulkar poverty line for urban areas at today's price is rupees 32 per person per day that is wholly insufficient for the purpose of defining poverty line it is self evident to anyone with common sense the way forward is not to fix the poverty numbers but to find a way out of this bankrupt approach of bpl targeting the third subsection is the bpl club in this the author talks about the plight of w singh's family in latehar district in jharkhand this article was published in the hindu newspaper on october 2nd 2011 under the heading struggle to enter the bpl club the author narrates the story of w a young adivasi who survives mainly by casual labor 
he fell from a roof at work and broke his back in 2009 he is paralyzed for a life and needs intensive care his wife sumitra looks after him their daughter and a small baby aside from few goats and hens she is unable to work for wages the family is on the verge of starv starvation bpl families in jharkhand are entitled to 35 kilograms of rice rice per month at 1 rupee per kg this comes as a green this sorry this comes as a great relief to these families but w's family doesn't have a bpl card the blues only hope is that his plight has been noticed soon after his incident he attracted the attention of the local journalist and later on the district collector local legislator and others everyone agreed that he should get a bpl card by way of immediate relief true to the jharkhand government's tradition of administration by gesture the district collector instructed the block development officer to do the needful and left it at that from then on various officers like bdo subdivisional officer sdo or block supply officer bso and so so and so passed the buck to each other for a few months w's well wishers pleaded his case all the way to ranchi and even delhi nothing doing one year down the line w still didn't have a bpl card when the commissioners of the supreme court took the district collector to task he finally admitted that the entire district administration was powerless to give a bpl card to w without striking someone else off the bpl list the district has a strict quota of bpl cards so no one can be induced unless someone is dropped anyway the local block supply officer finally managed to find a way forward someone on the bpl list on w's village had died and so had his wife and their son already had a separate bpl card so it seemed all right to strike off that name from the list and accommodate w it took another 10 to 15 days to complete the job w finally has a bpl card but there is a catch w may be deprived of his bpl card very soon this is because the bpl list is supposed to be redone after the ongoing bpl census and the methodology of this census is such that w's family meets only one of the seven deprivation indicators that make up the bpl score with the score of 1 on the scale of 0 to 7 w is almost certain to be excluded again the planning commission has made it clear that the bpl list is expected to shrink over a time many states have rebelled against the planning commission's poverty straight jacket and expanded the public distrib distribution system well beyond the bpl list the fourth subsection is on the poverty line india's official poverty line has been a subject of lively debate according to the planning commission's affidavit 
submitted to the Supreme Court in September 2011. The official poverty line stood at around rupees 32 per person per day in urban areas and rupees 26 per person per day in rural areas at June 2011 prices. They proceeded to state that the, final, the official poverty line ensures the adequacy of actual private expenditure per capita near the poverty line on food, education, and health. These measly norms reflect the fact that poverty line standards were set, set decades ago. Understandably, the poverty line today looks quite out of line with the bare minimum one would wish everyone to have. It is also interesting to consider the arguments that were used to make the dubious position look acceptable. First, to establish food adequacy at the poverty line, food expenditure at the poverty line is typically higher than normative food expenditure. Normative food expenditure per capita is defined by that level of food expenditure per capita equals the index of malnutrition. The index of malnutrition is an underweighted sum of the proportions of underweight children, adult women and men with low body mass index. Second, planning commissions for spokespersons repeatedly stressed that with the seemingly partly amount of rupees 32 per person per day should be put on a monthly basis and also on a household basis so that for an average household size of five, it becomes rupees 4,800 per household per month. They pointed out that rupees 4,800 per household per month did not sound so unreasonable. Why would rupees 4,800 per household per month seem more accept acceptable than rupees 32 per person per day when it is actually the same thing expressed in different units? The reason is that the monthly figure sounds more familiar. It sounds like the salary routinely paid to many workers in the informal sector. Living on a 32 rupees per day is in fact a constant struggle. But the necessity of circumstances has silenced millions of people into extreme forms of parsimony. The author narrates the story of Tushar Vaishisht and Matthew Cherian, who tried to live on rupees 22 a day after relocating themselves to a small village in Kerala. A supportive columnist, Harsh Mandir, described their experience as harrowing. They ate parboiled rice, a tuber, and banana, and drank black tea. A balanced diet was impossible. They found themselves thinking of food the whole day. They walked long distances and saved money even on soap to wash their clothes. It would, it would have been a disaster if they fell ill. As it is, they suffered from fatigue, weight loss, and other consequences of undernutrition, all without having to do manual labor. The Tendulkar Committee report led to an upward revision of the poverty line. What is really startling is not so much that 
the official poverty line is so low but that even with this low benchmark so many people are below it a full 30% of the population that is more than 350 million people how are these people supposed to live this basic message about the terrifying yet hidden nature of the mass poverty in india has been somewhat lost in the din of the recent debate there is evidence that various forms of public support and economic redistribution can make substantial difference to their lives without delay there is no case for leaving the poor to their own device then comes the fifth, fifth subsection beyond small mercies five hurdles this subsection helps us to understand how pension schemes for widows and the elderly worked in different states testimony after testimony opened the eyes of the author to the critical importance of old age pension as a tool of social security in rural india the first thing that struck him was the immense number of elderly people and their miserable plight they escape our notice most of the time they rarely complain at least in public but if you inquire about their well being the tales of sorrow are endless it is not just in poor households that widows and elderly have a hard time even in relatively well off families money is always short and the comfort of the elderly often takes a back seat in their harsh lives the pension was a chance to enjoy small comforts relieving pain with some medicine getting their sandals repaired winning the affection of grandchildren with some odd sweets or simply avoiding hunger aside from contributing the, to their economic security pensions give them some dignity and bargaining power the administrative costs are very low pension schemes for widows and elderly have five major flaws as things stand the first the narrow coverage according to the central guidelines social security pensions are meant for bpl families financial support from the central government is rest restricted to, to this category some states have launched their own schemes with their own funds to expand the coverage of pensions beyond bpl families in the context of pensions it is all the more inappropriate because widows and the elderly are often extremely deprived even in relatively well off households bpl targeting should be abolished in favor of a universal or near universal approach second the bureaucratic procedures numerous supporting documents have to be produced and it often takes years for application to wind their way up and down different layers of administration gram panchayat block district state and back in latehar district in jharkhand the author learned from the subdivisional magistrate that pension applications were being forwarded to the state at a snail's pace simply because he had to sign each application six times third low pension amounts the central contribution 
to old age pension has remained at an abysmal rupees 200 per month since 2016. It is an insult to elderly. Some states top this up with their own resources, but even the topped up amounts are more measly, except in few states like Tamil Nadu, where the standard pension amount is rupees 1000 per month. The fourth, the irregular payments. Often, pensioners have to wait for their pension for months without any idea when the next payment will materialize. More than 10 years have passed since the Supreme Court ordered the state governments to ensure that social security pensions are promptly paid by the seventh of each month, but few of them have acted on that. And the fifth, high collection cost. Even when the payments are relatively regular, collecting them is often costly and tedious for old people with little mobility, education and power. Getting to the nearest bank and queuing for hours can be an absolute ordeal. Post offices are closer, but the convenience comes at a price. Corrupt post office employees often expect an inducement. All these problems are relatively easy to fix. The main reason why they aren't is that the victims count for so little. The central government for its part seems unable to get its act together on this issue. The last subsection is squaring the poverty circle. The Rangarajan expert group in 2014 on poverty measurement has done a great deal of hard and useful work. In its recent report, it probes a wide range of critical issues. The combined brain power of four expert groups is brought to bear on the committee's terms of reference, including, most importantly, whether and how a particular method can be evolved for empirical estimation of poverty in India. The major aspects in this are, first, the calorie trap. The expert group has reverted to food intake norms. These norms are now extended from calor calories to include both protein and fat. These norms recently set by the Indian Council of Medical Research take into account the age and sex composition of the population as well as activity levels. Good, good nutrition depends on many factors other than food intake, such as sanitis, sanitis, sanitation, water, healthcare, and the disease-free environment. Second, implausible results. Implausible means not easy to believe. Interestingly, the rural poverty line proposed by the expert group is almost the same as the Tendulkar poverty line. It is for urban areas that the Rangarajan method leads to a substantial upward revision of the poverty line. This is highly counterintuitive and the expert group does nothing to defend the reality of this pattern. What is the way forward? The Rangarajan expert group method is both theoretically and empirically implausible. Appointing another expert group is unlikely to serve the purpose. Perhaps the time has come to abandon 
the elusive search for a technical method of deriving a poverty line that can be interpreted in some normative sense as the minimum cost of dignified living. The Rangarajan expert group recommends that entitlement programs should not be linked to the poverty line. This would effectively restore poverty line to their original statistical purpose of tracking poverty and making poverty comparisons without creating an artificial social division between the poor and the non-poor. Finally, it is very important to supplement expenditure-based poverty estimates with other indicators of living standards, relating, for instance, to nutrition, health, education, and the quality of the environment. With this, the chapter ends. Thank you. Thank you, Jito, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, yes, yeah, so throughout this chapter, we have seen that how, as Jito has uh, wonderfully explained, you know, all the points and basically highlighting some of the important uh, aspects and important issues that are mentioned in this chapter titled Poverty. And uh, as uh, those of us who are used to the book discussion forum, uh, we know that how uh, Jean Drez has this habit of, you know, giving a lot of examples, giving a lot of uh, life uh, stories. And here also we have seen the uh, uh, examples and also the life incidents of many people, including uh, W. Singh. And also we had uh, the two uh, boys, uh, Tushar Vashisht and uh, Matthew Cherian. So now the floor is open and I invite anyone to begin sharing their thoughts and uh, also what they felt first and foremost after sort of reading or listening to the exposition and if we can suggest some more points for the future that is when we speak about the way forward now we know the various situations the various challenges that is there in order to alleviate poverty from the country is there something that can begin at the grassroots levels? This is something that we can also ponder on as we uh, contribute our thoughts and opinions. Patrick, would you like to share something? Well, I, I did not listen to the entire uh, uh, review, uh, a book discussion, because my connection is on and off. So only I got a certain points, like uh, uh, that second point was uh, how to identify those who are poor or something. That was the one. And this W having problem being identified as poor, although he had many characteristics, like, you know, and he had only uh, out of zero to seven, I think his, uh, that his, his score was one. So a lot of issues, you know, uh, especially I think, I don't know whether it differs from state to state, uh, you know, like the indicators of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, poor people, in, uh, like uh, in Bablu's case, uh, someone had to be eliminated or, you know, like there is a, a specific number of uh, uh, space reserved for this, you no. Know, Poor people, or those who those who those who can be called poor, and uh, Since I have to go to the another meeting at seven o'clock, yes, I may just uh, uh, chip in uh, for the discussion. Uh, I had read the book, and uh, yesterday when I saw the advertisement, I had to reread the book again. So, uh, thank you for uh, choosing the right kind of uh, text for the discussion. Uh, and uh, primarily, I would appreciate uh, and applaud uh, the way Chito George uh, presented the book, uh, book chapter that is on uh, dealing with poverty. 
basically, he captured the whole uh, thrust of the of the book uh, by way of uh, appreciation. I would like to, he had a kind of depth reading, and he has brought out some of the main points of the book book chapter rather uh, rather than the book. Uh, however. Uh, for a discussion, like oh, uh, I would appreciate that towards the end, that you know, to create certain questions for, uh, for uh, giving a kind of lead for further uh, insight or further discussion. Uh, truly, uh, something that he has brought out is that uh, the whole question about the Tendulkar's uh, way of uh, judging the uh, poverty line, that is uh, in the urban area, that you have 32 rupees per person per day and 26 rupees in the rural area per person per day. It's a cruel joke on the poverty. It's a cruel joke on the poor people. Uh, and again, it has been given the example as to two young men going to Kerala and then uh, trying to live out uh, by 26 rupees per day. It is just next to impossible. So one can simply think of as to uh, what is the, the government thinking of the poor people? And again, uh, 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 trying to, by way of a, a scam or rather to cheat that, no, uh, just to calculate the 32 rupees, uh, you say, and make it for the five people and then give a lump sum rupees of 4,800 rupees. That sounds big, but ultimately it is the same thing. That is 32 rupees per day for per person. Uh, so basically, we never know whether we really require the common sense of the common man or common person uh, as to how one can live by these so little money. Uh, and I was going through this book also yesterday came across, uh, the Supreme Court has asked the government of India, please see that there is so much of hunger in the country and malnutrition, do something. And then they have suggested a way forward, uh, kind of have a, uh, setting up kitchen across the country to address the hunger and malnutrition. At least something like what Mother Teresa used to say, uh, before you allow them to fish, or rather teach them to fish, supply them with the fish, uh, perhaps, because people are simply, have, they have no way of fishing. They have no way of fishing. So at least you supply them at the moment for a fish. Uh, yeah, so way forward, uh, probably it is for us to think philosophically as to what is the way or the dignity of the human person, especially of the poor people. Uh, basically would be like the philosophy of hunger. What does it mean in today's time, in 21st century to be hungry in our country? And looking at uh, uh, kind of expansion of this is that you know, we have, on the one hand, we may claim to be the India to be a kind of uh, Vishwa Guru, uh, a kind of leading economy. On the other hand, we have also the most hungriest people in the world. Uh, well, in the World Hunger Index, we are 103. And therefore, it is a very pathetic, pathetic situation in, in, in our country. But uh, when we project outside that oh, India is shining or India is like, oh, we have so many airports and all that kind of things, the people down below do not count. And so there seems to be a kind of social Darwinism being promoted in the country. That is, those who are fit will survive. Those who are, uh, say, vulnerable will simply perish, or rather they will go to the gutters. I think this philosophy cannot uh, survive. We need to have a philosophy that is that incorporates one and all so that we can move forward as a citizen, uh, 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 as a civilization, or as a country. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Father Arjun, for those uh, comments and uh, insights on this chapter, and particularly highlighting some of the uh, current schemes also which are there. And most importantly, also saying that we need a philosophy that uh, incorporates, you know, all. So, Edward, uh, would you like to uh, share your views? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, um, I was expecting far more people and a uh, more passive role, uh, but uh, uh, this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, 
the the uh, uh, it is institutional. Uh, it, it is concerned with, uh, therefore, with conditions in a particular legal framework. But the overall problem is a problem I think uh, we all have of how to include, indeed, as you just said, uh, the poor and uh, all these methods with thresholds and boundaries and so on. Uh, lead to unfairnesses. This problem is not unique to what Jean Hez uh, was describing. You find them everywhere else. Uh, one needs a much more, uh, uh, what should we say, a broader philosophical uh, framework, which you all obviously listening to you have uh, implicitly. Uh, the question is, how do you bring it into policy. Um, the, uh, there is one solution uh, which is being tested in more and more places in countries at all levels of development, uh, which is universal basic income. And universal basic income goes to the other extreme. Uh, if you're there, you exist. And if you exist, you are entitled to a revenue. There, there is no other criteria, uh, indeed, for some extreme cases, not even the criterion of being um, a citizen of the country in question. You're just there. Um, the tests that have been done on uh, basic income do show that they provide, firstly, a sense of belonging. Uh, and secondly, uh, a security which encourages people to take risks, to adventure into things. There's a case in Namibia where uh, they, uh, they had a basic income pilot project in a small, relatively rural village. And one of the things they found was that households, once they had basic income, had far more um, farmyard animals, chickens and such. And this was surprised people and they asked why. And they said, well, before our income was so precarious and we were so poor that we didn't dare invest in a chicken because supposing the chicken died. But now, uh, with this basic income, we have the security. If the chicken dies, we can get another one. So we will get into it. And that created a whole local economy with exchanging of, of eggs and meat, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this is, uh, in a sense, you, you see I'm completely off the subject because I'm not talking about the details of particular social security systems. Um, it's very important that they be dealt with, uh, but I'm delighted you've held this uh, discussion. I've learned a great deal from it, and I hope you will pursue the matter. As you may have gathered, I'm actually a philosopher by trade, uh, and uh, I could contribute more substantially if the subject were at a more philosophical level. So I hope I'll be back on another occasion. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so basically, I would also like to share a few thoughts uh, as I went through this second chapter. Uh, basically, uh, one of the things that uh, struck me as I was reading the whole thing was uh, the case of W. Singh. And though this may be just one particular example that is highlighted in this chapter, but I think we can all relate and we can all... Uh, see various issues around us which have the same kind of background the same kind of circumstances uh, first and foremost it takes a very long time in order to get things moving so and basically when you go to apply for some scheme it's always moving from one desk to another which uh, sometimes takes days weeks or even months and I think when we speak about development, when we speak about, you know, having a rapid pace of development, I think this doesn't 
reflect the struggles that especially the poor, the marginalized, and those who are deprived of certain resources that they have to undergo. Because when we speak about development, when we speak about progress, I think uh, sadly what has happened is it's only a certain level of population that has been taken into consideration. And uh, as uh, it was already said in the earlier discussion that when we speak about development, speaking about good airports, good infrastructure, that actually doesn't impact the life of a person living below poverty line. So for him, what really matters is if there are schemes which could help him to at least live a respectable life. And there were certain things that were quite shocking for me, especially when I went to the chapter. First and foremost, having a strict quota for BPL cards. That means a person literally has to wait for somebody else to die in order to take uh, that person's place. And also the slow process, as I already mentioned. Next, we also see that the methods or the standards that are set up for these various uh, uh, schemes are quite outdated. Okay, so for example, uh, we were using a scheme of 2011 and probably living in India, you would know that how things have actually moved on. For example, the prices have increased drastically. So having those kind of figures of 2011 in 2021, in a way, doesn't make sense. And uh, especially uh, living with 32 rupees a day, living on 32 rupees a day, as was tried by those two youngsters over there, was, I think, really impossible. Because the way, even for example, in order to have uh, tea or even the basic uh, necessities, that really actually 32 rupees is quite impossible. And uh, next, I would also like to highlight uh, when it comes to the way forward, okay, when it comes to implementation of schemes. Now, on paper, there are plenty of schemes that are supposed to take care of various aspects of various social problems, including poverty. But when it comes to implementation of those schemes, I think there the problem lies because we see that at every stage, at every level, there is some kind of leakage. In a way, the funds that are given for a particular cause never reach that particular cause in its entirety. There's always some kind of leakage along the way. And as a result, what reaches to the concerned person is just pittance. Now, in the previous chapter, we also saw that how corruption at various levels also impacted this. And therefore, in a way, if I basically have to think of a way to look forward, first thing is we need to create more awareness because I'm sure that there are many who are not aware of this situation because when we portray development, we normally try, try to hide these kind of things. For example, in the year 2009, uh, there was this movie released called as Slumdog Millionaire. And the movie was heavily criticized for actually showing certain aspects of life in India. Okay, so here we see that. So we try to hide these issues there. So unless we want to really, if we really want to get these issues solved, we need to speak about it. We need to deal with this in a much better manner. And therefore, what we could do is at our own grassroots levels, we need to uh, create awareness and also try, try things in our own way in order to do our bit in solving this issue. Uh, and most importantly, I think we need to inculcate and also share with others this philosophy of incorporating everyone. Because everyone makes the country. It's not just one group of population. So this is what 
I felt after reading this second chapter. So are there any other thoughts or views that anyone would like to share? Okay, if not, in that case, uh, we can uh, close today's uh, discussion. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Jito for the wonderful presentation. Painstakingly, he has uh, gone through the entire chapter, prepared a wonderful presentation for us, and which makes it very easy for us also to uh, grasp the various aspects mentioned in the chapter. Thank you, Jito. And uh, next month, we'll be dealing with chapter three. So see you next time. Good evening and uh, thank you for joining us on this forum. Thank you.